Hello everyone, this is General Hand Grenade. Welcome to my war room in Prince George, British Columbia. Today's video is another in our series of Global War 1936 to 1945 version 3 nations. So we've gone through Germany and we've gone through Russia and this video we're going to go through Japan. We're just going to go right through the turn order as it is. So uh, Japan. Japan is part of the Axis uh, along with Germany and Italy. And it's, uh, it's actually a, a great nation to play. Like, uh, it, it, I wouldn't give it to somebody if it was their first game, just because it, it does take a little bit of uh, skill to play it. And the reason is because you're, you're, you're playing with a lot of uh, boats and you're doing a lot of amphibious assaults. And, and then there's also the ground game as well. But um, when, you, when you start talking about navies and, and uh, amphibious assaults and and uh, some of the new roles that are in, in version 3 when it, in regards to um, naval warfare, then it, it is a bit technical, like a little more technical, say, than Russia is. So, uh, but yeah, once, you, once you've got a, a game or two under your belt, though, then have at it, man. They're, they're a, a really fun nation to play just because there's so much involved in them, right? Uh, boats are fun to play with. I mean, it takes some skill, but but it's fun, right? Once you learn how to do it, it's a lot of fun. So let's take a look at, well, um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at, uh, we're going to explore the national reference sheets. Now, this is where all your information is. Um, the, the, the bulk of the information for the game is in the, the rule book, but uh, there's certain things that are only on these national reference sheets, and Japan has five of them. Uh, one of them is just the, uh, the setup sheets, uh, uh, two of the pages is uh, the units and the costs and stats and everything. And then the first two pages, like the other uh, nations, the first two pages is where most of the information that we're going to be looking at is. We're also going to talk a little bit about strategy and, um, um, and a little bit about the changes between uh, version 2 of the game and version 3 of the game because uh, there are some significant changes in the game and you do need to be aware of those. Um, if you're like if you play the uh, version 2 a lot um, you're just gonna want to revert to the old ways but be advised though you need you do need to uh, look through the rule book but I'll try to cover a lot of those changes as we go through this series so let's start uh, at the very beginning here and that's the Jap Japan national reference sheet you see up at the top there there's two scenarios 1936 1939 right uh, starting IPP for the 1936 scenario was 16 IPP and that is all of the places that have a Japanese roundel on it um, so the island of Japan but there's also part of China here like all of this stuff up here where you see Japanese units and there's a there's a Japanese unit down here there's Japanese units all over much of the islands although most of them don't have an, uh, an IPP value but if you were to add up the IPPs from all of those then it would add up to 16. And so you're, you're, uh, you're one of the belligerents, like Germany in the game, uh, as part of the Axis. And so you get full income to begin with. And, um, and that's right in the 1936 scenario. And then the 39 scenario, you start with 24 IPP. Well, that's just because you start with more territories. And I'm not going to bother showing you which ones they are or anything. Uh, you'll just see that when you go to set it, set it up. Uh, it'll be parts of China in there, so you'll just put the Japanese roundel on, and all the setups will be different, right? Like the the number of units on all the territories will be different, basically. So um, that's the way it goes, right? Now, as far as the overview, um, the the home country is it contains four territories. In version three, it was only three territories. Uh, like there was three islands in version three, right? There was this one, this one, and this one. But now it's hard to see it, but where all this stuff is piled up there, that's the city of, of Tokyo. So Tokyo ha is its own uh, territory now. And if you add them up, there's two, four, six, seven uh, IPP worth just in your home territory. Another thing to be aware of, you see this number two over here? Um, this is a narrow crossing. Um, uh, so you can't just walk from this island to this island anymore as many troops as you want. You have to use the, the uh, rules regarding narrow crossings. And they're different uh, depending on whether you're assaulting somebody 
or whether you're non-combating moving uh, we're not going to get into those though because this video would go on too long if i went through all the new rules but i just wanted to show you that it's new so uh the the territories are a little bit different and the, the, there's a narrow crossing here. So uh, we'll go through when we when we do go through the rule book. But you can take a look at the rule book now if you want. It's not very pretty or anything, but it's on the Global War 1936, or sorry, on the historical board gaming website uh, under the uh, version three of 1936 to 1945 Global War. Um, it's like a black and white version of the book that it hasn't been fully, fully developed yet. Anyway, um, uh, you can look there if you want to sneak peek at what uh, what the narrow crossings do. So um, when, when you when you play the 1936 scenario, Japan is at peace with everybody. Uh, they haven't declared war on anybody yet, um, but they can declare war on anybody at any time. Just like Germany when we went through Germany earlier, um, Japan has the autonomy. They don't have to worry about this needs to happen first or that needs to happen first. They, they can just they can just declare war on anybody. And they can declare war on a minor power. They can declare war on a major power. The only thing they can't do is declare war on Germany or Italy because they're on their side. Other than that, anybody is fair game. But um, when you do declare war on somebody else, there are consequences, right? Um, most of those consequences you'll find on other people's sheets. Like if you were to, uh, I did a video not that long ago, about a week or so ago, about a strategy called the Dutch Panic Hook. And that uh, involved taking out uh, the islands down here, the Dutch islands. And there were several consequences to that. And uh, so it just depends on what you do and what the consequences are going to be. Like huge consequences if you attack America right off the bat. You know what I mean? Uh, less consequences if you attack China. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> much less. So it just depends that in varying degrees of what you are attacking. And we're not going to go through all of those things because it would take me forever to describe, okay, this is the consequences for this. This is the consequences for that. Just know that, uh, that there are consequences. And those are the kind of things that you need to explore. I've got uh, something here that, um, that helps me out. Let me just show you here what I've made up. So these are the peacetime income increases, and those are mostly the consequences that I'm talking about. So you look at Great Britain on top there. Uh, Japan declares war on a neutral, including China, plus two each time. Each time Japan declares war on a neutral. Um, FEC, uh, Japan declares war on a, any nation, plus two. Japan completes a capital ship, plus one. Uh, Anzac, Japan declares war on China or on a neutral nation, plus two. And the United States, most of the United States consequences involve Japan. So there's lots of them. You know, the, the, whether you're declaring war on, on the Commonwealth or China or France, um, there's lots of them. And also when you're completing a new battleship or carrier, or even just pl placing a battleship or carrier onto the, the, the build queue down here, that there are consequences for that from the Americans. So those are the type of things that you need to, to watch out for. And this sheet that I just showed you there, it's got the peacetime stuff on the other side. I'm not going to make that available just yet. You can make up your own if you want. Really what I did was I just went into the rule book and, and copied and pasted everything onto one sheet. It's handy to have it all on one sheet so that I don't have to, if I'm the Japanese player, I don't have to go and grab Great Britain sheet and America sheet an ANZAC sheet, an FEC sheet, and Soviet Union sheet, and everybody's sheet, just to find out what happens if I want to attack China. You know what I mean? Like I could just look on there and, and, and find out. Uh, so anyway, um, 1936 scenario, you're, you're not at war with anybody. In the 1939 scenario, you begin the game at war with China, okay? Okay, so let's go through some of the things. Now we went through this in the Soviet Union video. But let's do it for Japan. And this is all about border clashes. Here, we, we can get rid of this thing now. You know what? Let's just come back to that. I'm going to get rid of this. So, border clashes. Now, this is something that, that's unique to a Japanese-Soviet border. Uh, it, it, it doesn't exist anywhere else in the game for any of the other nations. What it is, is um, without declaring war on each other, Japan or the Soviets 
can shoot each other across the border. So like uh, if it was Japan's turn, these guys, they, they could take a shot at this guy. Um, and then this guy would get a shot back at them, right? Uh, you could use planes too, but what you couldn't do, like if the plane was down here, say, you couldn't, you couldn't fly up there and then to here and then take a border shot with them. If you were going to have a border clash, that plane must start in the in in the zone, uh, the the land zone that you're having a border clash with, right? So uh, what I mean is the uh, the land zone that you're using to start the border clash. So these guys to these guys, you could use a plane. You do have to fly the plane in there, and then of course the plane can fly three more spaces on non-combat movement, right? Uh, because he does get his full movement, but he does have to start in that border, uh, uh, in that land zone that, that the border clash is taking place. Otherwise, you can't use a plane uh, in the in the in the border zone. Now, what ha it doesn't matter who hits who here when it comes to what happens at the end. Uh, let's say these guys manage to get a hit on this guy. Well, they don't roll across the border and take that territory. It just stays like that. The, the Russians keep that territory. All they've done is they've lost their unit, right? And and same uh, like if this guy, if they were to shoot and, and these guys lose, well, that's that's all that happens. If they want to try it again, then they lose this guy. Well, that's all that happens. Nobody crosses the border. You can't do that unless one of the uh, one or the other was to declare war. Then it's no longer a border clash anymore. Now it's you got to move in there and take the guy out. Um, as far as lend lease goes uh japan can lend lease to any nation but they have to be at war with a major power so um uh, uh unlike russia russia was able to lend lease to anybody regardless of what that nation's war status was uh not so with japan japan it doesn't matter what their war status is uh what matters is the nation that they give the, the the unit or the money to that nation has to be at war with a major power in order for them to lend lease to them um, there is only one special alignment condition and that's Siam so Siam is going to align with Japan in January of 1939 let's go down there and take a look at Siam see where it is here so in Siam you see there is one in one um, militia and there's also this torpedo boat destroyer so when that turn comes around you would just take this roundel off put the japanese roundel on it's worth one ipp so japan's income goes up one ipp and you would replace that guy with a japanese guy and the torpedo boat destroyer with a japanese torpedo boat destroyer actually i think i leave that one because their colors are similar uh that, that's one of the places that i don't have to to, to paint an extra one and what else we got here uh surrender so or, um, yeah if tokyo if japan loses tokyo um then they have one chance to get it back this is a a, a, a big difference compared to the other game although you know like if what happens here if, if tokyo is lost then then japan loses the money that they have on them doesn't matter if they only have the 16 ipp or if they're up and they get they're collecting like 50 or 60 if they leave their capital exposed and say the Americans come in there and uh, assault the Navy and, and drop uh, some guys down on, on Tokyo there and happen to take it, then Japan's going to lose all their money. And the game's probably going to be lost for the Axis at that point, but you don't have to. Like If you think that Germany's doing really well and you want to carry on, then that's fine. Uh, Japan isn't out of the game yet. You, uh, um, If that was America's turn or whoever's turn it is, you keep going until Japan's turn comes around again. And then Japan has until the end of their turn uh, to try to take back Tokyo. So like you could have a bunch of stuff on uh, on the rest of this island here. Um, and, uh, and maybe like they only took it with one unit left or something like that. Well, if you take Tokyo back, then you're back in the game. And then you would collect your income again and, and stuff. You wouldn't get the money back that you lost though. And then if you lose your capital again, you lose your money again. That lost money does not go to the conquering nation though. It goes to um, the bank. So only in the case of France, uh, Paris falling, that's the only time that, that the money goes to the conquering nation. With everybody else, including Japan, the money does not go to the conquering nation. Um, but just be aware that 
Everything you do, every, every nation, every island, everything that you attack in this game is going to have some type of consequences with the Americans, the British and the French. It, it all goes towards their income increases and uh, gets to their, their ability to declare war. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it, right? Like uh, it still might be worth it uh, for you to take even all of the Dutch islands. You know, uh, it, it, if you think that uh, the islands are worth more, in in the end then then all of those increases are going to be then by all means do it right um and yeah so anyway um so i've told you all about how they declare war and, and everything and um they can declare war on anybody at any time except for germany and japan so uh, they've only got one peacetime um uh income and that is they start the game with uh, three ipps from the Americans. And the Americans don't actually give it to them, it's the bank that gives them to them. What it is, it, it represents the, the oil trade that the Americans had with them. The Americans were giving them a bit of oil, not as much as they wanted, but they were giving them a bit of oil. And, uh, but once Japan started becoming belligerent, you know, once they attacked China, then the Americans started uh, slowly turning off those taps. And so how they represent that in this game is that uh, you start that with uh, three, but you, like you don't have it in your starting income. You only get 16, but at the end of that turn, um, if you haven't attacked China yet, then you, you get 16 plus three. And then say you attack China on the second turn, well now you get 16 plus two because you've attacked China uh, once. Um, it doesn't matter how many Chinese territories you attack, it just um, how often you've attacked uh, in, in China or any country for that matter. In version two, it was just China, but uh, in version three, it's it's any land zone for um, a combat move into any land zone. So uh, turn three comes along, you attack China again, like another land zone. Well, there you go. You just lost another dollar. So now Japan's down to one bonus. And then the third time it happens, well, they don't get any more bonuses. But that's the only piece of time uh, in increases that they have is just that three uh, oil trade from the Americans. On the other hand, they do have quite a bit of bonus income for being for their wartime income. But their wartime income, uh, they have to be at war with a major power. Like they can't just come down here and and uh, take out all of the Netherlands and collect their their wartime bonus income. Or they can't just go and 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 attack China. And collect their their wartime bonus income they have to be at war with one of the major nations right like they have to be at war with anzac uh, like an fec uh, the commonwealth right or they have to be at war with america or they have to be at war with russia or france or um well i guess that's about it <laughs> but they have to be at war with one of those major powers in order to collect their wartime bonus income so what those bonuses are once they are at war uh, there's this territory here. Uh, what is this one? Sumatra? Okay. Uh, so it's not Sumatra. So Borneo, Java. This is Borneo, Java, Malay. That's this one here. Um, the Hawaii, Hawaiian Islands and the Philippines. So the Philippines are here. And you know where Hawaii is. It's up closer to the United States here. And then... Uh, if they, if they possess uh, Midway uh, Island, Wake Island, or the Solomon Islands, that's one IPP each. Like these ones were two IPPs each. Uh, not for all of them, just, just two, two IPPs for owning this one. Two IPPs for owning this one. Two IPPs for owning this one. So they've got lots of bonuses that they can get, right? And then there's also one with China. And the easy way to, to uh, remember which ones they are is uh, they're the ones on the coast. <laughs> If you haven't figured that out. So this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Uh, what is it? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, there's only five of them. So Hong Kong is one of them. Um, what's this one? Kwangtung? Yeah, Kwangtung is one of them. Hunan. And uh, Peking up here. Uh, Shantung. So this one here. That's weird how they wouldn't get it for this one, for Nanking. That's the capital of China. But anyway, I guess uh, there is no, I thought there was a bonus for that one, but there isn't, okay? Um, so uh, 
the the strategic naval movement <coughs> up till now, like the first two nations that we did, strategic naval movement really didn't mean a whole lot because uh, Germany and Russia, you know, uh, it's it's not that big a deal. Now this is a um, uh, an optional rule, but I would recommend that you play it because it's a good one. It's rule 15.10 in the rule book. And what it is, is on non-combat movement, uh, each nation has a, a number and they can move that number of units from one port, one friendly port to another friendly port. Uh, it doesn't even have to be your own as long as, uh, it's you or a nation that you're aligned with. Right? So, uh, um, the number for Japan is four units. Of course, that's that's much more than the other two nations that we've already looked at, and that's because Japan is a seafaring nation. But the 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 thing about those units is it only includes transports or the things that go on transports. So anything that's allowed to ride on a transport um, is is eligible. But and the transports. How you would use it, like why it's such a good idea, is um, it, like you get to go five spaces from port to port. Like uh, say you wanted to attack the United States or something. That's a long ways away, right? So uh, let's find something that would be five. Okay, uh, one, two, three, four. So that's four away. Five. So if you were to attack over here and you were to take out a, a, a place over here, Right on the in on the American mainland on this season, if Japan were to come along here and do that uh, and drop their stuff off, they could take their transports all the way back here uh, in one turn. That would be five five uh, spaces away. So that's what makes that good, right? Like it's not so much um, getting them there uh, in, on a non-combat movement, although it could be. Like if you know how a transport shock works then you would have transports bought back here while your transports were attacking up here. So then these transports come back and these transports move forward, right? And it just keeps going like that, right? But anyway, that's how that's how uh, uh, you get gain an advantage by using that strategic naval movement. Um, it's a non-combat thing. Um, probably, like, it's not as cool as when you're moving the transports with things on them. Although it could be, like you could move them up and then attack next time, but you could probably do that anyway if you really look at it. Like if you took Hawaii, then you could uh, move forward to there and then move forward on the next turn and there you go. Now you're on the, the American mainland, right? Um, so there you go, that's strategic naval movement. Um, let's go over here now. Uh, let's talk about the Japanese... Um, Victory objectives. Now everybody has, you know, that's giving me some glare there. Everybody's got their own victory objectives. And Japan's, they, they have up to seven points. So two of them is colonialism. Uh, you can get uh, two points if you have more than 50 IPP uh, combined. So that's, uh, that's your income level. Plus it's also uh, your um, bonus income as well. So you get to add both of those together. If they add up to more than 50 at the end of the game, then you get uh, two points. Pacific security. So there's there's uh, a whole bunch of different ways uh, that you could get it. So in, you need to own uh, three of, of all of these. So Midway, Wake, Guam, Hawaii, Caroline, and Marshalls. You need to own three of those. And if you do, then you get one point. And then there's raw materials. So there's a, a number of these as well. You can score a victory objective for owning any one of these. So British Malay, uh, Coke and China, uh, um, well, I guess uh, both of those uh, French territories you would need to own. Then there's the Philippines, then there's Borneo, then there's Java, and there's Sumatra. So you would get one point for each of those, but up to a maximum of four points. So that's, that's the points that you could get in the game. Now, let's just pause this for a second. So let's talk about Japan's special abilities. And believe me, they do have some good ones, right? Uh, so the first one, it's uh, it's called surprise attack. It's kind of like uh, the Germans, you know, that that get this one turn where they can just go ape, ape shit and just you know <laughs> wipe out everybody. But it's not exactly the same. Like they don't, there's no two impulses or anything. So the surprise attack for Japan is works like this. Uh, Japan may make one surprise attack on one land zone or sea zone 
the term that declares war on the British Commonwealth or the USA. The attack can be used against the British Commonwealth or the French or the Dutch or the Americans, but you can't use it on China or the Soviet Union. So in the zone that you're attacking, all of the Japanese aircraft in there gain first strike capability, right? Uh, and that's pretty cool because, I mean, your planes are, you know, like even your fighters are, all, are shooting at six and your medium bombers, your tactical bombers, they're shooting at seven, right? So, I mean, first strike for those are just deadly, right? Um, so uh, you're getting first strike for, for all of your aircraft. And the enemy, no matter what kind of unit it is, whether it's a ship or whether it's a, a dude or whatever, depending on what you're attacking, right? Uh, they all get minus one. So that's pretty devastating. Um, also, that's not all. Uh, if you're using ships, you know, like you, to do the combat movement, whether you're going and doing or going for a naval battle, or if you're just going for an amphibious assault, right? Uh, your ships get to move uh, plus one, um, a bonus plus one. Like that doesn't include the bonus that you would get if you were at a shipyard. So, for instance, if you were in this zone here and say you wanted to attack Calcutta, right? So you're here. The, you've got a, a major naval base there. I mean, you've got lots of major ones, but anyway, so you got plus one anyway, right? So uh, you go one, two, three would be your normal movement for those boats. The plus one for the naval base, right? Uh, oops, sorry, here we go. Uh, so here, let me try that again. So one, two, three, plus one for the naval base, and then plus one for the surprise attack. So you can get your boats all the way to here. Not your transports though, because your transports are only, uh, they only move uh, two to begin with. So your transports would be here if they started here. Obviously, if you were gonna do that, you would start your transports here, right? Uh, if you were going to come up here and do an amphibious assault. But if you were just, uh, if you were just, uh, there was a Navy here and you wanted to attack the boats, then definitely all your ships that are going to go th three spaces normally, could make it there and do a surprise strike and then your planes of course are going to be first strike uh probably the best thing to to do with your first strike is take out the american navy because um uh if you can take out the american navy i tell you there's the there's nothing that's going to stop you on the pacific side of the board over here you know uh once that navy's gone because it, it takes america a long time to build up that navy right they don't start with a bunch of money they start with six bucks right so it takes them a while just to get to even fifteen dollars and then uh you know like they're not buying much right they're then leasing a bit and you know they're getting a little bit here and there uh for boats but their their uh, navy isn't building up so by the time you're ready to attack them but uh the bring the americans into the war um, they're going to have a bit more than this, but, but not a ton, right? So if they make the mistake of putting all their boats into one sea zone, what better option would you have than to, to skate across there and, and, and wipe them all out at once, right? Like what, when you, when you're thinking about, uh, all, all as many planes that, that you could bring into it, right? Like if, uh, you've got lots of turns before then, and Japan's going to have a lot more money than the Americans, right? Um, in the first part of the game so they could be building up their planes and, and stuff and then uh, um, drop a couple of carriers down at the at the end you know like this one here you can move that along and and uh, maybe put another one down as well so you're only getting a, 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 a giving the Americans a plus one bonus on their uh, peacetime income you know it's just so you got more carriers right and then uh, you load them up and everything and you're all ready to go and and then if that guy makes the mistake of putting all his uh, boats in one place wipe them out right uh that's the best thing you could do that's happened to me twice uh twice that i've been the americans i made that mistake twice i'll tell you i'll never make it again uh your best bet is to put your boats in different zones for the americans it doesn't matter how many zones uh but put them in different zones don't put all the good ones in one zone you know what i mean like split the good ones up split them up with with little ones and they can still attack you you know but at least they can't do that surprise strike where you're minus one in that zone with all of those boats and they're and their um um first strike with their planes in that one zone at least they, they they can only do that in one of the zones and then the other zone 
you know, you got a fighting chance with your other boats, right? So uh, that price attack is pretty darn good. Okay, the next thing is kamikaze. Now, kamikazes are, are going to work differently now. This has changed. And also, if you've, if you've downloaded the Japanese national reference sheet, you'll read in there that where it says uh, you get eight of them. But that's, that's not correct. You only get six of them. So <laughs> this is my second time making this video. That's one of the reasons, just so you know. Um, so how it works is uh, you can do it on offense. Like when it's your turn, uh, you can go up. Uh, before it was, you know, like when you were right around the island of Japan, right? Not anymore, boy. You can go when it's your turn. You can go four spaces away. So uh, assume that you're... Your um, your kamikaze plane is is sitting on Japan, and you don't have to use a scout for it, right? Like you're not killing off a fighter to do this. Uh, I've got some some planes already painted up that I that I paint them red, and I use them for kamikazes, right? So you can go four spaces away, up to four spaces away. So one, two, three, four. You know, like where wherever that's going to get you. Uh, one, two, three, four. You can go to uh, midway if you wanted. Um, there is no bonuses on there like you, you you're not going to get uh the bonus uh for the uh the shipyards or anything like that it's just within four spaces of of, of the japanese island there uh you can go and you can use your kamikaze now you can use two of those per turn um but that's uh I, i've checked into that as well <coughs> excuse me and that is two per round okay so let's say uh it's your turn it's japan's turn and you go and you wipe out uh or you try to wipe out uh, two boats at least anyway um what you do is you go out there and you attack them and you roll and it's a seven or less now if you roll a one to two uh like a two or less then then you get um target selection so you can pick the boat like if there's five boats there then and and you get uh, one target selected then you can pick the boat that you want uh to take out with your kamikaze um otherwise like uh it's just a normal hit and the defender's going to pick which what their casualty is so let's say that was your turn japan now on that same game round uh like uh, uh britain goes and then france and then italy and eventually america's turn comes around uh let's say and then the americans decide to uh to attack uh, the island of Japan here, um, you can't do any more kamikazes on that round. You can only do two per round. So you have six in total, but only two per round. Uh, now the other way you can use them, other than uh, going out four spaces, is that you can use them in this space, C zone here, in this C zone here, so the ones that are surrounding the islands of Japan, and this C zone here, the one that is uh, where Okinawa is. So those ones there, if somebody is, uh, uh, if somebody is, is trying to do uh, an assault on you there, an amphibious assault, then you would hit them um, on the shore bombardment phase of the amphibious assault. And of course, if you're getting a, a, a target selection, if you hit your target selection on that, then that'd be great if you could take out somebody's transports right you know like you, you pick that transport say you're gonna ask them okay so i want you to tell me uh you know like don't just put like four transports over there and a pile of dudes i want to know which dudes are on what transport because you're going to pick the the transport with the best dudes right and say i'm killing that sucker right there i mean why why bother taking the the cruiser that's all they're getting is is the bombardment shot right like you might as well take out the transport and the two units that are on it that are doing the amphibious assault, right? So that's pretty cool, the kamikaze. It's quite powerful in this game, but again, remember, you can only do two on one game round. The next thing is dug in defense. And so all of the Japanese land units uh, that are defending in their home country, so the four, uh, like Tokyo and, and the three territories and Okinawa, they always uh, uh, include Okinawa. Okinawa in the, in the home country. Um, uh, anytime you're defending there, just with your land units, they are plus one. And so it's, I tell you, it's really tough to assault the island of Japan because not only are your land units plus one, but if you look, that is all mountains in there. So whoever's coming in at you, unless they're coming in with mountain infantry, they're going to be a minus one going into those mountains, right? Um, and uh, 
And speaking of this island here, <laughs> this is an island nation it's referred to as. So uh, if all of your country's major naval bases, shipyards and dockyards are blockaded, then uh, you only get the money, the income from those territories that are in the home country. But you, you're not going to lose any money on the convoy rating because the convoys can't get through. So what a blockade is, it's uh, here, let me, let me bring this over here and I'll show you in Japanese ships, even though it's not the Japanese ships blockading. So what you're looking at is surface warships. So a, uh, a destroyer, surface warship, right? A transport, not a warship, even though it's on the surface. This is a surface warship. Battleships, absolutely surface warships, right? Tra uh, submarine though, that's not a surface ship. It's a warship, but it's not a surface warship. So you see what I mean? This is a surface warship. This is not. This is. This is not, right? So um, that, that's pretty easy to figure out, though. It's just the surface warships. If you've got three in this territory and three in this territory, then you've surrounded the island of Japan, and Japan can only collect the income that's here. So that's two, four, six, uh, or sorry, this is one. So one, three, five, seven. Japan is only going to collect seven IPP. And the only good thing is, is that these two convoy lines can't be raided, right? But I mean, that, that doesn't happen that often to Japan anyway. Uh, the big deal is that your uh, income is down to seven. It, it could be that you're, you've got all of China, you know, and half of Russia. Doesn't matter. You're not going to get that income if the American Navy slides across the ocean and, uh, and blockades you like that, right? So um, there is one more, but I'm going to throw that in with the units, okay? So I'll be right back. As far as country-specific units or unit changes, there are a few for Japan. Um, the, the, one of the best uh, country-specific units that is on the entire board is this one right here. It's your, your good old-fashioned destroyer. Uh, for Japan, a destroyer has the added ability of carrying one infantry class unit and that is huge boy because I tell you like um, you go in with a transport let's say you just want to it's not a big huge amphibious assault it's just a small one and you go in with a transport and you know like uh, something to escort it so it, it doesn't get wiped out right uh, but you've only got two units on there right and um, of course there's double casualties in the first round so uh, you know unless you're going with Marines or something um, it's uh, it's pretty tough to take something out with, with that. Even if you brought in some air power and you and you only have a couple of infantry, so you you land your infantry and you you, you manage to take the guy out, but they get one hit and so you lose your infantry. So you didn't actually take out your objective, right? You didn't manage to take that island. Um, so uh, having that destroyer that can carry an extra guy. You know, there's a warship that's coming along with you that has a lots of abilities. So, you know, it's got all the abilities still of a destroyer, but it's got that extra guy, that one extra guy. So when you're going in for, you're going in with three units and not just two, and that makes a big difference. And even if you are bringing um, Marines in with your transports, uh, the fact that you can bring in one more with a destroyer just makes it uh, a much better uh, opportunity for you to take your objective right and I tell you you can't buy enough of these things I've, I've painted up 22 of them for my game here and uh, you might see 20 of them on the table or more uh, just because they're that good right I mean a destroyer in itself it sees a uh, uh, like it it, it, uh, it nullifies a, a submarine's uh, first strike ability so it does that right uh, it uh, it can pair with a, a plane on maritime air patrol to take out a sub like when you're sub hunting and uh you know plus it's uh it, it attacks and defends at four so it's a great warship to begin with right it's only seven ipp and so when you consider that i mean the japanese um uh destroyer is just one of the best units on the board you know um Anyway, the best one of the best country specific units on the board. I mean, like sure you could get you know a jet fighter that's probably a <laughs> or something you know a heavy carrier. But uh, yeah, this is a, a an awesome thing to have if you're Japan. You can't buy enough destroyers, but um, it just, there are too many. It's just great. So this is a, a regular um, uh, marine, 
and everybody's got these right but the difference uh, with Japan and the United States is, is they've got elite Marines. So this is a special Navy landing force guy right here. And uh, whereas this guy attacks at two and defends at four, this guy is going to attack at three and defend at five. So he's actually got some bite, which is really important because uh, the way amphibious assault works in the game is it's only the infantry class units that, that are getting off the boat in the first round on an amphibious assault, right? Unless you have attack transports. If you have attack transports, then you can just drop anything off. But I mean, unless you've developed that technology, and for most people and for most of the game, you're just you, dropping off infantry class units and hopefully having some air support to, to accompany them. So having this guy dropped off, where he gets to at least attack at a three, you know, which isn't awesome or anything, but it's definitely better than two. And especially if you're, you know, a lot of islands are, are mountain territories, right? So having a, a three just gives you at least a, a shot at, a, a, a hit in the guy, you know, at least getting into the second round where you don't have double casualties anymore. And then, you know, if you do manage to take your objective, then uh, it's much tougher to take that spot back because this guy's defending at a five now, right? So a uh, really, really good unit to have. Um, you can only buy two of these per turn, right? Uh, just like any uh, of the specialist infantry, like mountain infantry, you can only buy two per turn. So it's like that, you can only buy two of those a turn. Now I put the tank here, uh, a tank's not new, but the, there is a difference in the tank uh, in this version compared to the last version. We're talking about a medium tank here, right? Like your regular tank. So a medium tank for the Japanese in this game is going to cost you six instead of eight. In the last game it was eight, and they did that because Japan just wasn't really big into the medium tanks, but uh, they decided why not just put them in at six, you know, like uh, <laughs> it, uh, just to be fair to them. And, you know, uh, but you know what? A tank isn't going to be that useful for you. When you look around, I mean, the best thing that a tank can do is blitz, right? Lots of mountains here, right? Uh, there's some territories in here, so, you know, like there's a blitzing ability here, but you already own that. You know, I guess you could do a bit of blitzing in here, and maybe just a little blitzing down in here too, but then it's all mountains and jungles, and, you know, and, may, and then you get over here, okay, a little bit more blitzing, and then more mountains, you know what I mean? Until you get out here in the opening territory, in the open territory out here, uh, not much blitzing ability. And of course, you're also island hopping, right? Um, Japan's taking out islands. And so uh, when you look at it, uh, when you think about it even, uh, so you go and you, you drop your tank off on an island, right? You've taken it. Well, you can't blitz that turn anyway, you know? Um, you have to wait until the next turn and then you can attack, right? But then you, there's nowhere to blitz to, <laughs> you know? Uh, so there, the, a tank isn't going to do you that much good. Uh, you're probably better off with two infantry or, you know, even an infantry and an artillery that costs you seven or even an artillery and a, and a militia, you know. Um, I don't know. A, a tank isn't that good of a buy for the Japanese just because of the terrain that's involved over here in the Pacific. So sure, it's come, it's come down to six IPP and uh, you might love your tanks, so go ahead and buy them. I guess you could use it pretty, you know, like it would, would do, some, do you some good over there in Australia. You can get around there pretty good. Um, but yeah, I like it's not, it's not great, right? Uh, then the last thing is this guy right here. This is a Patriotic Citizens Fighting Corps. Um, he is a militia, uh, just like any of these other militia. Like what I usually use for a militia is like an Axis and Allies dude, right? And then I put him on one of HPG's uh, militia chips. So, but um, this guy here, he's exactly the same thing. I've decided to paint uh, some of these guys with their bases painted yellow. That's the HBG Dutch Infantry. Uh, what they are is um, if the Americans put uh, five transports down in the Pacific Ocean, if, if at any time in the game they've got five transports, then you can build militia in your home country. Uh, so that's these uh, four, four territories plus Okinawa. You can build militia there for one IPP. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it doesn't take long to build that island up. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to paint a base on these guys. Because I think that island, if you, when you get to that point where it's, okay, it's time to go back to the island and, and pile everything up. 
it's going to get pretty crowded in there, right? So I just thought that uh, by doing this, it's going to uh, give me some extra space. And uh, I've got uh, five of them. So there's five territories, right? And I just, you know, I'll just put chips onto them after that, right? Um, but yeah, it's going to be tough to take that island out, though, because, you know, you're, you're buying cheap militia. And remember, all your stuff gets to defend it at plus one. And that's in a, <laughs> a mountain territories, all of them. And so, you know... Good luck for anybody trying to assault it. Um, actually, there is one more thing I want to show you, and that's over here. Now, um, on your uh, build chart, they show you that you get these three escort carriers. Some people make the mistake of, uh, of thinking, like, it, it tells you specifically they don't go on the board until you're at war, right? And, you know, that's true. But they think they can just move them along, you know, even though they're not at war. And you can't. This is why I don't even put them on the build chart. What I do is I put them beside the build chart because you can't touch those. They stay where where where, the, where they start on the build chart. They stay there until uh, until Japan goes to war, and then you can move them along. Like these ones, you don't have to pay to move them. You just move them, but you can't move them until Japan goes to war. So, like the first turn, Japan declares war. Um, or has a war declared on them or whatever, then this one will go on, right? Because it's in, in, the, uh, in the place units box. So that guy will go on, and then these ones will come over, and then next turn they'll go on. I think they start in number two. <laughs> they might have got bumped, uh, but I think they start in number two. They might start in number three. I don't know. You'll see when, when uh, on your build chart. Just all I'm saying is don't move them along until, you, you, until they're activated, okay? Uh, they can't slide along by themselves. And so I think that's just about it. Let me just take a look at the sheet there, make sure I didn't miss anything. Don't think I did. Um, but yeah, Japan's a lot, a lot of fun to play. A little tricky though, because of all the, the naval uh, stuff involved. Naval and amphibious assaults, all that stuff is a little more technical, right? Um, um, a lot easier to play uh, something like Russia. I mean, Russia's not an easy nation to play because, I mean, you're the only guy on that faction, right? But uh, you, you don't have any help. But, I mean, easier to learn how to play, right? Uh, but, you know, if you're all new players, and heck, go for it. You know, play Japan, right? It's not actually the hardest nation. We're going to get to that one next, uh, the hardest nation to play. But uh, it's a lot of fun to play. Lots of island hopping and... Uh, and plus, you get to be the bully over here on this side of the board. Like you're the you're the biggest you're the biggest bully over here, right? Um, until late in the game, when those guys when those guys come in the game. So that's all I got for you today. Um, yeah, that's all I got. So take care, everyone. General hand grenade out.